Hello and welcome. You're watching CNBC Africa and this is our special all-day live coverage of this year's general election. I'm Chris Bishop and I'll be following the story every step of the way and I'm joined on this set with uh, an esteemed panel here uh, to talk about one of the issues at the heart of an election that South Africa needs to get to grips with or perish. Corruption and service delivery. Too much of the former and too little of the latter are eating away at the gains of a quarter of a century of freedom and democracy. The cost of living with corruption and lack of service delivery means higher risk and costs for business as well as misery for a lot of people. In the studio, I have to take this debate further with uh, David Lewis, the Executive Director, Corruption Watch, and Professor Tuli Marunsela, Stellenbosch University's Chair for Social Justice, and Professor Narnia Butler Muller, uh, Professor of Law at the University of Fort Hare. So I can just uh, start out with you, uh, Tuli Marunsela. I mean, you're the former public protector. You uh, made a, a life out of uh, chasing down corruption in this country, often at uh, great risk to yourself. Um, what would you say? I mean, it, it, the whole point is, my, my point on it is that it's robbing people of what basics they should have. I mean, it's one of the, the oldest jokes among journalists in Africa. People say about two presidents pointing out and saying, look, uh, you see that bridge over there? I got 20%. And the other one says, you see that bridge there? And I, the, the second president says, I see nothing. And they say, oh, I got 100%, you see. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, um, you know, it's robbing basics from the people, taking uh, services from uh, the very mouths. What do you think the cost of it is to a society like this one? Well, thank you, Chris. The cost of corruption is huge. Um, it is, firstly, it undermines social justice because it creates a, a field that is not level. The corrupt get opportunities they don't deserve. They also might not even be prepared to deliver. But secondly, it steals money from development because it channels money to things we don't need. But also in those projects, there's overbilling, there's false billing, and there's overcharging. And um, yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about business corruption as well. But just when you took the job of public protector all those years ago, and um, bearing in mind you're an activist too, how shocked were you about what you found? Well, the first shock was what you just said about the 100% in, in 20% was when that joke, when I had that joke for the first time in Nigeria, I had just become a protector and it was the end of 20, uh, uh, 2009. And then when I, and then I laughed and I thought, no, this could never happen in mm. South Africa. And there I was, I mean, I wrote the report, or my team and I wrote the report, pipes to nowhere, because there were no pipes. And somebody could have seen that there were pipes to nowhere in Nala Free State when they signed off, then they paid for a project that was supposed to deliver a, an end to the bucket system. So you pay somebody, but you're still stuck with the budget, uh, bucket system. In Northwest, we came across a situation whereby somebody delivered only the, the show house, having been paid 400 million for an RDP settlement. So, so those are the things that shocked me because I thought, yes, we do have corruption and we've always had corruption in this country. Nelson Mandela, or President Nelson Mandela, spoke about it. And what he expected us to do was to end the existing corruption instead of perfect it. And sadly, but what shocked me also was a little bit of indifference by people who should have come to the party to support me. And I think the governing party during my time dropped the ball big time. Some of the opposition parties at least uh, uh, played some role. The governing party dropped the ball then. And, and I'm hoping you know, the new dawn means we never again look the other way when we see wrongdoing. Uh, David uh, Lewis of Corruption Watch. I mean, state uh, corruption, is, a lot of it's been dealt with at the uh, state capture inquiry and what have you, but it's only half the story. Um, often you can have endemic in the society, business corruption as well. Um, what evidence have you found that, of that in your work? You know, we're asked about that a lot, and I think, I think it's a bit of a red herring, to be perfectly honest. I mean, cor corruption, most corruption, overwhelmingly the majority of 
corrupt conduct happens at the interface between the public and the private, whether that's a, a driver and a traffic cop or a CEO of a multinational corporation and a minister, the public, it's at that interface that corruption happens. And so, you know, if you asked uh, uh, Cash Paymaster Services, McKinsey, KPMG, Bosasa, whether they thought that there was a focus only on the public sector mm. corruption in this country, they'd tell you probably that they thought the only focus was on the, was on the, on the private sector. I mean, the reason why the public sector tends to get focused on to a greater degree is because we, the public sector, belongs to us. Mm. Exactly. We elected exactly. public mm. representatives mm. who appointed public officials and who one of whose major tasks is to regulate extremely powerful private interests, mm. like the private business sector. And it's when they get into bed with them that you have a problem. When that interface mm. becomes blurred, mm. that you have a problem. But there's no question about you know, public sector corruption only being half of the problem. Of, mm. of course it is. Mm. And each, in s each side of that equation, to some extent, has to get its own house in order. Mm. But basically what you want to do is you want the public sector to know that one of their principal tasks is to regulate powerful private interests, whether those be, you know, powerful sports associations or mm. more importantly, the private sector or not. You want that interface a respectful but independent, separate interface to be uh, maintained between the public sector and the and the private sector, and it's the fact that those interests have become so deeply intertwined that we have a corruption problem. Uh, talking about that, I mean, in terms of business, I, mean, I know you would have studied everything in this particular field at, at this particular time, but uh, sometimes there's a very thin line between what people might in this day and age call good business and what other people might say, corruption, and you might say, oh, you know, such and such a minister is my friend, you know, I want to send him away for an all expenses paid trip, etc. But on the other hand, you're trying to um, get favor with that particular yeah. business person. It could be seen as corruption. Yeah, and look, I, I think, you know, you may be a CEO who has a friend in mm -hmm. cabinet. They may have been, you know, in prison together with you in days gone past. You don't, you, you don't send the minister away on an all expenses paid mm. holiday. Mm. You just don't. No. That's a relationship you forego at that stage. O on the other hand, you know, it's very important that business and government maintain an open relationship. That interface is a potentially very important productive interface. But there have to be watchdogs like the public protector. There has to be a strong law enforcement uh, system. And above all, there have to be strong civil society and strong media to monitor that relationship, to watch that relationship and to expose it when it becomes, when it shades over into buying favor and, and buying privileged access to public resources. I mean, one thing I want to come for a legal um, point on this, a quick one. Um, I mean, surely in, with technology advancing the way it is, it's easier than ever to keep a tab on corruption on anything in business at the right now. Because I mean, if you even look at my, ourselves or myself, certainly you could go forward and uh, you could see exactly what I've done, what I've spent, where I've been in the last two weeks, no problem, because it's all there on record. Just a, a quick one. I mean, shouldn't it be easier now? Well, I think that transparency is, is still a problem. Um, and we've been talking about that uh, for a long time now, that there are things done behind closed doors. Um, there were Saxon worlds. You know, not everybody had access to Saxon world. Not everybody had access to what was um, being said there. So even though we have a situation where technology is, uh, has developed to a certain point, we also can manipulate technology. Um, and so transparency is still not where it should be. Um, and accountability, therefore, is, is lacking. Okay, hold that thought there. We're going back to the polling stations now for another view on uh, corruption and business. So uh, my colleague there, Fifi Peters, who I understand is standing by with Stephen Kosef. Fifi. 
Yeah, that's right, Chris. I am standing by with the ex-CEO of Investec and a current executive director, actually. He sits on the board of Investec. In fact, he also wears the hat of uh, chairman of, uh, of uh, Bidvest. But we, Bidcorp, there you go, Bidcorp. But we are, he's, you know, you know, Stephen, he's, he's not one to, to be shy. Stephen, the conversation is about corruption in a business and uh, quite topical right now, given that uh, we finally got that uh, annual result statement out of Steinhoff coming out yesterday. Yet we haven't really seen any action being taken on those who are involved in that scandal. Your views on corruption in business and how, as we enter another administration, we fix this. Look, I think the first thing is we have to have capacity in the prosecuting authority to deal with corrupt crimes of that kind of nature. They're complex. Uh, these are very clever people who devised uh, very devious schemes to make something look like it's not. And uh, I think that until you start putting people in jail, then they'll know they can't get away with it. And it's not put, putting in, you know, um, some of the ineffective people in jail. They are leaders of these processes and they need to put, be put away. And I think that until we start doing that as a country, and that's probably what frustrates a lot of people, is that there, there is, has been no consequence for corruption generally for a long period of time. And I mean, I think many people are hoping now that with um, the, the, the current SARS commissioner, Edward uh, Kishwita, who yeah. was quite instrumental in heading up that illicit um, financial flows unit in his previous time at SARS, that we could see, you know, more of that kind of behavior being, being, being curbed. Yeah. But uh, to talk to me a little bit, uh, Stephen, about what, what motivates it. I mean, we look at you business people, you've got the money, you've got the, the lash houses here in Houghton. I mean, what motivates such corruption? I think, uh, you know, there, there, there will always be a percentage of people that are inherently corrupt. That's it. Now, the consequences of corruption will determine whether they commit a corrupt act, the governance and the processes around them. Uh, so sometimes in business you'll have a very charismatic leader, and that very charismatic leader will, you know, rule by fear, very autocratic. Um, and uh, you know, no one challenges. So, people in organisations, the culture of organisations, are exceptionally important. So that there is a question, there is challenge, there is governance. Those processes become very, very important. Because if you corrupt at the top, then it starts filtering all the way through, as we saw with our country. So, uh, you know, it, it, there are people who will be inherently corrupt. Yeah. It's just a question of whether they activate it. In fact, we brought a guy to one of our conferences um, a few years ago, a guy, Ricardo Semler, Brazilian, and he said 10% of people are likely to have some form of corrupt or dishonest tendency. That's now, they won't all activate it. Yeah. But, and that's what he's saying is the factory setting of a human being. Right. I mean, Stephen, in terms of uh, uh, the corruption, it looks like an, an unfortunate culture that has been allowed to grow in South Africa, and I'm in, uh, uh, dealing with it. Currently, we do know that uh, President Ramaphosa is going to win. Um, uh, quite questionable, the uh, people, a few people that he did mention that would join him on his cabinet, people who have been uh, alleged to have been involved in corrupt activities. So you've got a government that right now isn't working hard on holding those who are corrupt to account. Therefore, I mean, do you trust that it's going to be any different in the next five years? I'm hopeful. I think that uh, what we've seen since uh, uh, President Ramaphosa became president, he has appointed uh, you know, a number of commissions. Uh, I understand he's created a special court to deal with some of these charges. Very. Uh, in a, a, a speedy way. Uh, obviously he's appointed a new public prosecutor. Uh, I'm hopeful that um, she appoints strong people to operate with her and that she starts taking action against corruption because the only way you really kill it off is if people understand that there's a consequence. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really is very, very important to start taking action and putting people away. And I think that's that, that, that's the difference that we as members of our society want to really see. So the president looking to raise some 1.2 uh, trillion rands in um, investments in South Africa over the next five years to what? Dollars, so is it, it 1.4 trillion. Oh, I forget that you're a man who operates and is used to operating in multi-currencies. Um, let's, let's do your dollars. Um, how, how confident, to what degree um, will 
cultivating a culture in which corruption is not tolerated, in which there is accountability whereby business people and government officials go to jail, help the president in getting more money into this country? Uh, no, certainly it helps because people want to know that when they invest, they're going to get their money back or that their property rights are secure and that uh, the environment is conducive to investment. So those are very important aspects. Obviously we need a business friendly environment because if we don't have a business friendly environment then we're not going to get the kind of investment he's looking for because people want growth. It's no point us growing at uh, below 1% per annum. In fact, growth really, the, the lack of growth in the last nine years or ten years has really cost our society dramatically. If you take what it's cost us in terms of GDP uh, it's over a trillion rand. What does that cost Tito in terms of revenue? 280 billion. His deficit was 250 billion. Can you imagine what he could have done with the extra money to help deal with the kinds of issues that we have with infrastructure, with delivery of services, with all those things? So you need an economy to grow. A growing economy that generates GDP, creates jobs and enables government to get capacity to deliver services. So those are our challenges as a society. Sure. And we have gone down the wrong road. We have not been business friendly. We have too many regulations that are anti-business, too many processes that are anti-business, and we're not going to create jobs unless we're business friendly. You can right. forget about it. All right. So when as, you start as talking as about land without compensation and all those kind of things, there are other ways to do it. You can deliver land to people in a way where you collaborate with the farming community, where they train and develop the people so that they know what to do with the land. If you give me a piece of land, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, it's, it's worthless. You have to know how to use the land in an appropriate way and therefore form a partnership with the farming community. Say, this is not acceptable anymore. You guys can help uplift your community by, and they will do it. Stephen, I mean, as one of the pioneers of the CEO initiative, yes. let's, let's, let's give a wish list to the president now. Um, what should he do to create that more friendly business environment so that we can get the kind of growth and the jobs that you're talking of? Okay, the first thing we have to do is address the capacity of the state. So we have to fix the state-owned enterprises. If we don't fix the state-owned enterprises, you don't fix Eskom. And you know, the task team came out with a recommendation split it into three. Okay, fix the financial structure. That can blow the whole country out. Sure. So that's, that's, that's his first job, is fix the state-owned enterprises, form a proper alliance, which he has tried to do with business and labor. Labor needs to back off. Labor needs to change their philosophy from job protection to job creation. He's got, that is a big shift in psychology. If they stay with job protection, then you will find that there are no jobs. Right, right. Let's go for job creation. How do we create jobs? Encourage investment, encourage, and which is the president is trying to do. But make sure that the environment, that the capacity of the state functions. Stephen, we are going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, because of the interest of time. There you guys uh, had it, the views of the uh, former CEO of Investec, current executive director, as to you know how to deal with the corruption. People need to go to jail, he says, but also how to get more money into uh, South Africa's economy. Land expropriation without compensation, he says, is not going to work, Mr. President. But Chris, uh, let me hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Fifi Peters there with Steve Kosev, one of... Uh the nation, we're just seeing pictures there of uh, President Thabo Mbeki um, voting. Uh, Kopano Gumbi is there. She's hoping to get a quick word with the former president of South Africa as, or just after he casts his vote. Kopano, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Bishop, I hear you well. Can you hear me? Indeed we can. So just tell us what's happening. We're seeing the pictures. We don't Great. quite get the context at this stage. There is a... There is a flurry of excitement. President, former President Thabo Mbeki just walked in to the voting station today. He likes to walk from his home, which is nearby, um, and cast his vote. So he's come in and there's a lot of excitement. He's just putting his mark on what we assume is his party, ANC. Um, and we hope to get uh, five minutes with him just after he's finished voting here. We'll be crossing back to you to give you more with the former president himself. Okay, that's Kobano Gumbi there with the former president, Thabo Mbeki. Let's continue our discussion here. We'll go straight back if he decides to give us a few words after casting his vote. Um, well, you heard that, Dave. <laughs> what did you think? Um, saying that people at the top should be the ones who should be thrown inside. But I don't know. I mean, I know fish 
rocks from the head and all that sort of stuff. But on the other hand, I mean, a good example for you is um, in Kigali from our, our bureau there. They tell me that when you get a traffic policeman, he'll give you a severe wigging, but he won't give you a ticket unless he knows he's, he's going to find you. Because once he's done it, it's his responsibility. If he tries to make the ticket go away, he knows he'll be fired and perhaps put in jail even for corruption. What, what do you think? Should it be at the bottom or the top or right the way through? Well, you know, I think it has to be r right the way through. But, but I think right now in South Africa, the, the litmus test for whether government is serious about tackling corruption has become whether named people, s mm. well-known people, are investigated, prosecuted, and sent to prison. And, you know, I know that that's not easy to do. I don't want the sort of scenario which I think so too many people envisage that the president will now order the NPA to prosecute Mr. X mm. or Ms. Y. That's not what an independent mm. prosecutorial authority is about. Mm -hmm. But it is absolutely imperative that in the first year of the new administration, which I presume will be a Ramaphosa administration, mm. that there be serious people who we all know, politicians, business people, public officials, it's absolutely imperative. And, you, you know, I think it's the best way of, in most immediate way of telling people at the bottom that uh, they'll come for you as well. Mm. I mean, you know, as for the people at the bottom, you know, I think if, if five motorists and five traffic cops mm. were arrested for bribery mm. in one week in Johannesburg, you'd see it plummeting. Yeah, the word. You know, yeah. But, but there, there've got to be consequences. And, you know, in a sense, the hallmark of the last uh, administration, of the Zoom administration, is that not only did you not get punished for corruption, you got rewarded for it. You got mm. rewarded not only by the vast amount of wealth that you accumulated, but by retaining higher high offices in fact by achieving even higher offices and people have to see the opposite of that they have to see that crime doesn't pay basically uh, julie Maroncella, i mean the, the state mm. capture commission i mean i'll be quite frank with you uh, in the last year i've seen president jacob zuma in the dock um facing charges at the state capture commission i've heard things i thought would never ever come to light but the question i have is does the state or does the prosecution set up, does it have the teeth to start putting people away from this commission? That's what a lot of people are asking. I believe that the NPA does have teeth to start prosecuting people. The NPA did not wait for, for the commission. If already there are dockets that have uh, most of the pieces of the puzzle, the NPA can proceed with people. There's lots of books that have been written about state capture and the grand corruption that is involved in state capture. There's already also enough information on some people that has emerged from the various commissions of inquiry, particularly the State Capture Commission. However, I do, I do want to, um, to endorse what my colleague Dave just said, is that what is required for the, from the president are two things. Get out of the way of the National Director of Public Prosecutions, and two, be unequivocal in supporting the NPA and all of the oversight agencies. Just the way the, the, the first Prime Minister of Singapore did things, Lee Kuan Yew. His approach was, it doesn't matter how much I like you and how close you are to me. If the Bureau for, for Investigations is on to you, if you come to me, I will out you. I will tell the public that you've tried to get me to protect you, mm -hmm. and I will not protect you. So that's what we would like President Ramaphosa to, to do. And then also to make sure that his government provides adequate resources to the NPA and all of the other oversight agencies. And just lastly to say, it's all about consequence management and ending impunity. The president has promised us that <laughs> impunity is ending, so but, we're looking forward to that. But a question for you, <laughs> uh, you yes. said get out of the way of the NPA. How likely is it that President Ramaphosa would stand in the way of any prosecutions? 
Well, we have learned now from the cases that are emerging in, 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 in the state capture inquiry that there were people that were protected. Uh, when prosecution started, we've heard uh, on, for example, um, uh, 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 the, the testimony that was given by Agrizi. If it's true, mm. then it does seem that uh, elements of prosecutorial services were captured for the purposes of making sure that when um, accountability mm. was uh, was being exerted, they stand in, in, in the way. And, and this is how it, 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 it happens, is people in public service should make sure that they don't love freebies, mm. because it really starts with the love of mm. freebies. Uh, if you want your child to go to China for free and mm. you're not prepared mm. to pay for them, then you are going to be in trouble. Mm. People offer you all the time free time you want to go for a holiday somebody says oh i've got a a house a uh, by the beach yeah. uh, in in the cape why don't you go say no to freebies because mm. what happens is this these come as if they are um well intended but uh, there's a saying in siswati that <laughs> says that when when if you've given an important person a freebie but that freebie comes from the money uh, that was corruptly obtained. When the investigation starts on the corruption, you go to the person who got the freebie and you say, hey, they're trying to expose your bum. So this person <laughs> now who got a tiny bit of mm. the stolen money becomes the protector of the looters because he or she is trying to make sure that their own bum is not exposed. So stay away from free freebies. But Simple as that. What I don't get sometimes is people think that people are going to give them something and then that's it. It's just <laughs> a little present for them. I mean, like, there's no free lunch. Where do you <laughs> live? No you know, free I mean, it's madness, you know, really. But <laughs> question I have to ask in all of this: we, we as a lawyer, I mean, how um, secure are you about the judiciary in this country? I know in recent years, Mukwege is a good example. They've stood up and said, "No, we're going to do our own thing." What's your view on it right now? Well, let them, well, as I was saying earlier, importance, transparency, accountability, mm. and consequences. So we need to make sure that the judiciary remains strong and independent. And of course, all our other institutions are uncaptured um, in order for the consequences to be there. Um, and so far, we've had a judiciary that stood strong. Um, I mean, there was even a conflict at one stage between the president, the former president, and uh, the chief justice. And it was very publicly uh, held, the, the uh, press conference and the concerns that were expressed around trying to influence the judiciary. So I don't think that that's, that's an issue. Um, but I think that uh, consequences uh, should be uh, there and in fact every single main political party has this in their manifesto that we need to deal with corruption um, and that there should be prison sentences imposed. I think um, the EFF talks about uh, 15 years imprisonment, the DA talks about 20 years imprisonment in their manifestos um, as well as the protection of whistleblowers. So you know, the parties are saying that they are very taking this very seriously because they realize what the costs were and that the public is not happy with this. But I just want to say something about some research that we've done at the Human Sciences Research Council. The question was posed to people as to whether corruption, the corruption that is so rampant, is going to change their vote. And most people do not vote on issues in this country they vote on history mm. and it's it's very very clear that even though corruption has been rampant there's not going to be much of a change but we need to remember that this is not a presidential election we aren't electing uh, Ramaphosa as president um, it's the party and the party's going to decide and the party split so let's see if he's uh, powerful enough to to deal with this and to deal with the corruption within his own party as well as, of course, the interface of public and private corruption that was talked about earlier. Well, an interesting point you mentioned there, Dave, which I'd like to put to you, Dave, is um, this idea of, especially business corruption, this idea of whistleblowing. I mean, we've done many, many stories in the newsroom here about poor people 
who saw wrongdoing, they went and told the authorities exactly the right thing, and then they were ostracized. Their careers were destroyed. How do you protect people in this situation? Yeah, you know, I think that you protect those whistleblowers by celebrating them, mm. by making it clear. Mm. There, there is still a current that thinks of whistleblowers as impimpies, as mm. spies. You mm. want to do exactly the opposite. You want to treat them like heroes. Mm. But I think that we've also, you know, particularly in the Zondo Commission, being introduced to another reality that South Africans are going to have to get used to, that very often the best whistleblowers are not angels themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've usually, people have been deeply complicit in, sure. in corruption because it's by its nature a clandestine affair. They're very, more often than not, there are not, there's not the heroic outside observer who happened to pick up something in the dustbin and split on the, on the boss. It's usually somebody who either fears that the prosecutorial authorities are gonna get him and he gets in first, or, as I think in the Agrizi case, he who feared, I think, I read, that the Watsons would stab him in the back. <laughs> and so he stabbed them in the back first. Anyway. And, and we're going to get have to get used to uh, plea bargaining around that as well. Some awful people getting off. Anyway, hold that here. thought now. We're going over to the former president of the Republic of South Africa at the polls in Park Town. Uh, CNBC Africa Markets reporter Kapano Gumbi joins us live with the man himself. Yeah, Chris, well, let's not waste any time. Let's get straight into it with the man of the hour. Former President, you've just cast your vote for the sixth administration. What do you think is key for the new administration to unlock this economy? I think one of the things I think I, I would say is that we need uh, an urgent get-together among all of these people called social partners, government, business, labor, and all that really to, to look at what it is that needs to be done with regard to the economy. And I think critical to that is the matter of the levels of investment in the economy. The levels of investment in the economy are too low and have been too low for many years. And without that, that investment, we're not going to get the growth levels that we are, we are talking about. But it's a challenge, <coughs> that issue. To, to everybody. It's a challenge to people who've got the investment capital to say, why are you not investing? Because I don't think they are investing adequately. There's a problem about that. To say that even, uh, even if they do invest, there's an issue that will arise, which is do you have the skilled workers that would be required in terms of the jobs that would then be created? And so there's a, 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 a question that the government must answer. What is it doing with regard to making sure that the skills, the skills that are required are there? <clears throat> there are other matters that are very important in this regard because we've got a very open economy. And therefore the question about research and development in terms of competitiveness becomes important. We may very well build a new factory tomorrow. If it is not keeping up with te technological development globally, it's not be going to be able to compete. When people talk, for instance, about de-industrialization de uh, in South Africa correctly, and part of the reason for that is because the manufacturers, including government, did not pay sufficient attention to this matter of technological development. So you are able to produce shoes, sure, but because somebody else elsewhere in the world has attended to the matter of technological development, their shoes outcompete your shoes, and your factory will close down. So I'm saying even that matter about research and development becomes part of this question. I'm, I'm, I'm laying down an agenda for the economic conference that I think we must have. But, I mean, given that you've, uh, you've outlined the challenges, where do you think in our economy as it stands there are opportunities for growth? No, I, I think that there is opportunity for growth everywhere across the South African economy. I think everywhere. <coughs> it depends on what the players, that's the investors, the government, the workers, the trade unions, it depends what they decide. It depends what they decide. Look, take, take, for instance, uh, an obvious example about tourism. <coughs> this country has got enormous potential to attract tourists. But then we've got to sort out our visa regime. 
you can't have serious obstructions with regard to getting visas and hope that the tourists are going to come. And I would say also we, uh, South African Airways, the Air Fares, I think it's the most expensive airline in the world. So how do we expect these tourists to come, we carried by SAA to South Africa? If we're charging much more for the air tickets than any other airline. So I'm saying that it depends. We can, we can ensure that the, the, the tourism industry grows in this country. It depends what we do, as with any other sector of the economy. Thanks a lot. I hope you voted. Okay, thanks. I did vote. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your time. Right. Okay. Thanks, Kofar. Thank you. All right. <laughs> the, uh, are you still on? Okay, that, that, was, that was former President Tabo Mbeki giving us his views on where he thinks the economy can grow and hopefully the new administration was listening. Back to you in studio, Chris. Kapano Gumbi out there getting the rough and tumble of uh, reporting an election for the first time. Well done. And I'm sure that uh, interview is going to create a lot of debate out there saying that uh, SAA is the most expensive airline in the world. Ouch. But funny enough, actually, the, another interview we've done here in not too distant past, people were saying to me from outside of South Africa, were saying, like, listen, you've got this airline that flies everywhere, flies to Dubai, flies all over Africa. Why are you guys trying to close it down? You know, I mean, I, <laughs> it's one of those debates I think that's going to be tackled by the new administration. But um, case in point again, um, just, um, just looking at that, I mean, Tabo Mbeki's time, uh, do you think that he put enough in place, do you think? I mean, it was more uh, your time than, uh, than others. But, I mean, do you think he put enough in place to actually build a corrupt-free uh, government, especially when it came to business, do you think? I think um, corruption like Rome mm. is something that happens over time. Mm. And sadly, what we saw in the last administration would have started a growing during the apartheid government, Mandela government, Mbegi government, and then just blew up mm. in, in the last administration under President Zuma. But I think what President Mbegi did, which was important, was being unequivocal about uh, uh, being anti-corruption and being unequivocal in his support for the Scorpions and, and for the agencies, because that matters. We, we spoke earlier about uh, whether you should start at the bottom or the top. Mm. My view is both the top and the bottom matter more than the middle. Mm. If the messaging at the top is consistent, uh, then people notice. And if the support for the, uh, for the consequence, for the accountability and consequence management agencies, um, if, if that support is consistent, it makes a difference. But so is it important though to deal with the traffic officer, the mm. home affairs person, the licensing officer, because the problem is that if you don't handle that kind of corruption, you create a culture where corruption is accepted. Mm. And, and when it starts with that small corruption being accepted, and then the rest of it becomes easy. Because we spoke earlier about what works for corruption and we see it, the judges, the journalists like yourself and opposition parties are important and then agencies such as the Power Protector are important. But the people are important. Mm. Part of the reason we are not winning the war against corruption is the very people who loot from the people go back to the people for support. But what's happened during the state ca capture investigation? All they needed to do was to gaslight the people mm. and say that your problem is not corruption by mm. within our own circles. The problem is white monopoly capital. Mm. The problem is we want radical economic transformation. Which is my last point, Chris, and which, which is where I disagree with Stephen Kosov, mm. is if we don't go for a, an inclusive economy up front mm -hmm. where everyone has a stake not just in jobs where everyone has a stake in all aspects of our economy we're not going to win the war 
on corruption because people think, why should I protect an economy? Why should I protect a clean government mm. that doesn't save me? This one might steal, but they give me the crumbs. Mm. And that's why my mm. emphasis going forward is social justice and my emphasis is working with uh, Mike Swelling at mm. the Sustainability Institute is to work towards a socially just and growing economy. Sure. A uh, question for you, Dave, talking about business and the issue of corruption. Uh, another conspiracy theory I've heard is that in these desperate economic times, we're living in a lot more businesses are perhaps stepping onto the wrong side of the corruption line in the interest of survival. I don't, you know, I don't have an impression of that. I mean, I couldn't confirm that or, or dispute that. Um, but I think, you know, yes, the, you know, the South African business and the reputation of doing business in South Africa has taken an extremely severe knock. Mm. And there's no way of getting around that. But for business to start playing a much more active role, not only in getting their own house in order, but in getting their own society in order. Mm. Mm. And, mm. and they're going to be challenged in doing that. Mm. There's a great deal of distrust of big business in, in, in the country, and they need to do it. And you know, I have to say that one of the ways in which they should think about doing it is by willingly and publicly cooperating with institutions like our own. Mm. I mean, we are not natural allies, business and ourselves, mm. you know, just from personal style and mm. everything, but it would make a very important statement mm. if they worked together with others who were not only interested in getting a narrow little getting your compliance mm. programs in place, but we're getting, but we're, but we're we're about improving the environment in which we all live and in which we do business. And I think that's going to be a really important nettle for business to grasp. At the end of the Zoom admin 